Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, thank you for the Family Medicine Department in Kuwait uh, through the Ministry of Health, and thanks to JSK to sponsor this talk. Actually, my job today is trying to convince you about the message we have to take for a patient with asthma, uh, which is basically adherence, and adherence with regular treatment. So, uh, those are my disclosure, and the topics that we are running is uh, the challenges that we're having in asthma management. Um, there is what is called a proactive uh, regular drug dosing that we need our patients to be adherent to. And then what is the evidence of the role of PRD in asthma management? And if we are using a regular steroid with this cut on the use of the SAVA, the short-acting uh, beta agonist. So uh, we have guidelines. The guidelines doesn't mean that we fit them to each and every person, because one size doesn't fit all, and we have to tailor our therapy. But it's just guidance, uh, guiding us into our uh, journey of a treatment of our patient. So, what is the current uh, challenges in asthma? Actually, the, the most challenging thing is that asthma is a chronic disease, but it is fluctuate in its symptoms. So the patient would think that he is cured of it, and suddenly they get the symptoms when they are stopping their medication. So we need to adjust our patient's behavior. We need to have early treatment. And we need to find our steps in our management of our patient among different guidelines. So again, shall we put one exam for different creatures to climb the tree, for example? It's the same when we are having a guideline that we cannot fit for all the patients. So asthma, it's well known to be a chronic and burdensome inflammatory disease. It is a disease that wax and weans with symptoms of cough, dyspnea, uh, and they have to stop their activities in between, and then they have to awaken at night, but it goes differently from one day to, day to another day, from one week to another week, from one season to another season. And it has been shown to affect more than 262 million people worldwide. It has caused uh, globally, more than 461 deaths per year, and in the States, for the next 20 years, it has co uh, projected to costing more than 300 billions as direct medical costs, not the indirect even. Plus, the quality of days assessed, uh, as, um, associated with asthma loss uh, is like 15.5 million uh, lifetime. So, the, the, the biggest ch uh, challenge for us is to have a good adherence for, of our patient to their treatment. What are the causes of poor adherence of the patients? Usually because of several factors. Most um, uh, important among them is that Patients do have a period of being asymptomatic. And then they would say they might be controlled, and that's a poor perception of asthma control. Our communication with our patients, unfortunately, busy clinics, no time, patient is rushing, so there is no proper uh, communication. The misconception, what would be the misconception most of asthma medication? in your patients, what is the myth that they are carrying? Steroid phobia, steroid dependence, steroid side effects. But that's because of the maluse of those steroids throughout the last 45, I would say, or 40 years of medical practice since they have been used as inhaler plus oral ones. And then the beloved Bakhakh uh, al-Azraq, Ventolin. Everybody is carrying the Ventolin in their pocket for a quick relief, so they get dependent on it. So we have to break this cycle. And it has been shown in five real-world studies 
that among the patients who were prescribed inhaled corticosteroid as a treatment, they were only taken 20% of the time, maximum two, uh, three, 60% of the time. So we have to find uh, our way with our patient to uh, enlighten them of asthma uh, necessity of regular treatment, adherence to this treatment, so that we can get a global control of the asthma. So, uh, a proactive regular dosing uh, is the meant of it that you put your patient on a, on a fixed dose or stepped up dose of inhaled corticosteroid throughout the course of their disease. And that used to be the one in the previous guidelines. But then the newer guidelines has shifted a little bit to the PRN use. So let's see the regular dosing of a steroid, how it will fit our patient's profile. And um, the most important thing to know that uh, globally, all the, uh, all the guidelines will use the inhaled corticosteroid, but they differ in their uh, uh, guiding on how to use them. Some of them are consistent with uh, genus, some of them are different. So, the, the latest GINA guidelines, you are all aware, aware of it. I don't have to go in details, but uh, just say that when you have a patient, just confirm the diagnosis, look to the risk factors, and do them as much as possible of a spirometry. And I do know that in um, the primary care, the privilege of a spirometry is very occasionally there. So you try to get yours, even if you get a fund from any of the um, uh, companies, still we get it regular from our ministry. Look to the comorbidities. Every time your patient is coming, check their inhaler technique and whether they are doing it properly or not. And then look what is their patient goals, what is their preference of a treatment. Having done this, we will go to the track. And you do know, previously, the track was telling you SOS uh, asthma, um, short-acting beta agonist with a low dose on health steroid, and then you build up the dose. But then they come with a, 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 a track one nowadays, which is saying that in step one and step two, that is a patient who might be having symptoms of asthma less than twice a month, but not more than four to five times a week. Then you give them um, uh, SOS inhaled, cort inhaled corticosteroid with uh, a LABA. Uh, with the LABA which is used there is the formiterol. Maybe you were asking why for meterol? Do anybody knows? Rapid action, because it has a, a better beta agonist activity compared to the other labas. Okay? But the uh, alternative one is sticking to the uh, taking the saba, which is short acting, but make sure that they will take an inhaled corticosteroid with it. Once they go to the step two here, they should have um, a maintenance low dose of a steroid, which is different from here. Then the step three, step four are the same in two uh, tracks. Just having a low dose regular inhaled corticosteroid in, stage, in step three, and a medium dose of inhaled corticosteroid in step four. When you go to the fifth step, it is a further step where you put another controller. This another controller could be anti leukotrins could be the LAMA, or it could be uh, you get your patient even to be phenotyped, and according to the phenotyping, you will put them on biological treatment. Okay? So let's see what is the most important scientific fact. The most available effective treatment of asthma these days is the inhaled corticosteroids. Because corticosteroid is not acting on the level of the cellular level, be it structural cells, the epithelial shedding, or the endothelial ones, or the uh, uh, goblet glands and the mucous glands. Suppressing their activity accordingly, they suppress the inflammation, which is 
mainly by the T lymphocyte, some of, and the dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are for the IgE production, IL-4, and the T lymphocyte will have also IL-4, but also IL-5, acting on the eosinophils and mast. And here, I would like to mention something. The T lymphocyte is beyond the, uh, the, the, the inflammatory thing, which is with the T lymphocyte, is beyond the theory nowadays of phenotyping. You will hear two type of uh, uh, population of uh, patients uh, of asthma. Those who have high T cell activity and those who have low T cell activity. High T cell activity, we call them either allergic or eosinophilic asthma. Low T cell activity, they are less than 50% of the whole population of asthmatic worldwide and it is related either to systemic disease, COPD, obesity, smoke, but they are out of the eosinophilic allergic asthma, just to make things clear for you. Now, most of the guidelines adopting inhaled corticosteroid as a, a regular dosing uh, in their guidelines, like the American, the Spanish, the Singaporean, the Japanese, the Canadian, and the Koreans. Whereas the Australians, they are keeping the, the, fix, the regular dose of steroid among other controllers. And the uh, American and the Brazilians, they keep it like the, what is the GINA guidelines as the alternative to the PRN inhaled corticosteroid rather than regular inhaled corticosteroid. But at the end of the day, there is inhaled corticosteroid. So, in the, in, the, in the GINA guidelines, actually, why they went to the um, PRN inhaled corticosteroid at a lower dose? Because of the patient poor adherence. So they are accepting the patient behavior. They are giving the track that you give them uh, a PRN inhaled corticosteroid with an alternative of a regular corticosteroid if they are more adherent. Because the, the eventually what we need is an asthma management that will get the patient adherent, his symptom is controlled, his exacerbation is decreased, minimizing their um, risk of hospitalization uh, and other risk. Uh, other uh, c complications of asthmatic patients. Now, how far should we keep from our patient? We might be too far or we might be too close. We need to be close to the patient, understand their psychology, knows what is behind the triggers of their asthma, and try to, to explore why they are having, uh, if they were non-adherent, why they are having this poor adherence. So, uh, as physicians, we might not consider how much we know our patients or how much we understand our patients. So there was um, um, a, a big study which was conducted um, and, and released in 2021, which is called Apparent 2, a multinational online survey done for the patients and the doctors. And they found out that many of the patients, they said their asthma is controlled or partially controlled. Um, only, only less than 10%, they said they are not controlled. And um, among the whole group, there was more than 50% of them, they were reporting symptoms. So if you say that less than 10% are, uh, are poor control, how come most of the time you are having symptoms? So the, the patient is not appreciating their symptom uh, severity and frequency. The same thing with the, uh, with the physicians, uh, as you could see here. They are not, not perceiving their patient's asthma symptom as they should do. Uh, so uh, there was like 1,080 physicians from the same areas. And when they checked with them what is the preferred treatment, the preferred treatment was the regular dosing of inhaled corticosteroid, but like 71% of them. But of those 71%, 75% were pulmonologists and chest physicians, whereas other physicians were not. 
among those who are producing, who are following the uh, proactive regular dosing. When we say proactive, you are anticipating a problem and you're trying to tackle it. So you have a patient on regular dosing rather than being reactive. Uh, that's when the patient is having uh, the symptoms or exacerbation, then I would act on them and I would reduce the treatment or stepping up the treatment. And unfortunately, those patients who are having the MART, which is the other track with the um, as needed treatment plus the maintenance, 85% uh, of the patient, instead of having only one inhaler that they can use it, uh, as a maintenance and SOS, they were using another short-acting inhaler, which is wrong. The MART, which is the track one in the GINA guideline now, says that in step three and step four, the patient should be on a regular dose of inhaled corticosteroid regularly, plus they can use the same inhaler when they have more symptoms as SOS. Because we do know that formiterol is a short acting, so they can use it, but still, those patients were having SABA with it, short acting beta agonist with it, which is wrong. Then when they look to the uh, doctor patient, what is the most important thing of your treatment? They said as a symptom control. The patients were looking for symptom control, 40 to 46 percent, rather than the exacerbation reduction, which is, more, which is worse. Do you know that each exacerbation is a risk factor for the next exacerbation, and then there is shortening in time between each exacerbation gets shortened. If it was like every three months, it would be like every two months, then every few weeks. And unfortunately, the same thing among us, the physicians. Uh, the, the priority for them is to have 44% symptom control. And the exacerbation reduction was only as a goal in 33% of the patient, which is, shouldn't be. So we have to increase awareness of both the, the patient and their physicians. So uh, another thing, they were looking, in a, there was a paper on the consensus among physicians. What is the most important thing? The consensus came among all those 82 panelists of experts. They said, we need to educate the patient. We need to get the patient adherent. So this is inherited in the physicians, but we need to get it into practicality. So to, 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 to work in this, we have to look to the evidence, how is a regular inhaled corticosteroid working in mild asthma? All of you know that what we are seeing in our patient is just the tip of the iceberg. We are not seeing the cascade of inflammatory things which is going downwards, airway inflammation, airway remodeling, bronchial hyperresponsiveness that result in exacerbation, symptom of the patient, decline in the lung function. And it has well known that patients on regular inhaled corticosteroid, and if they use the SABA as PR and you are controlling their symptom, you are decreasing the exacerbation, you are improving their lung function, and reducing hospitalization ER visits. It has been shown that proactive regular dosing, even if it's a small dose of budesonide 400 uh, once a day, is shown to uh, decrease the uh, pheno uh, production in patients with asthma. And you know, what is the pheno thing? It's a measure of inflammatory uh, reaction in a patient with asthmatic, uh, degree of their inflammation. So this is a decrease with regular small dose of inhaled corticosteroid, plus their asthma control is improving with daily inhaled corticosteroid versus intermittent dosing. When we look to the first exacerbation risk, the patients who are on regular dosing, there is a good increase, decrease in the risk of exacerbation by 44% if they are using their inhaled corticosteroid regularly. Now, how many types of inhaled corticosteroid do we have available here? We have fluticasone fumarate, fluticasone propionate, we have budesonide, 
and piclometazone, right? So if we look, compa comparing those different molecules at a small dose, I'm talking about the small dose. If you look to the uh, regular dosing with uh, pro uh, fruticazone uh, fumarate or probionate or butacinite, all of them will have a sustained bronchoprotection if the patients are adherent. But if the patient's adherence is decreasing, then this uh, bronchoprotection will come to 26% uh, of the time getting a protected airways. So if you look, which is the one that gives a longer duration, it is the fluticasone fumarate and fluticasone probionate. And when we say Five small... Five minutes to go. Sorry? Yeah. Five minutes oh, to really? go. Oh, really? We are far. So what's the evidence of uh, um, uh, moderate asthma? The moderate asthma, uh, uh, patient with regular steroid, they will have a control of their asthma by 77% if you, they are using inhaled corticosteroid and the bronchodilator. And then uh, this will lead also that if you extend it beyond the three months, they will go from uh, uh, well controlled to totally controlled. And then the patients also, uh, if they're beyond the three months, they're, they're, they're uh, lung function and the quality of life is also improving. And the other thing is that their exacerbation is also improving. And that means that with the prolonged treatment, you are controlling all their inflammatory um, process. For the fear of people who might say, if I put my patient on a long-term inhaled corticosteroid, what is the systemic effect? Actually, if you compare different molecules, you could see that those on MARTS, uh, on budesonide, they have, if it is a higher dose, then they might go into a bit of systemic effect, but with the maximum dose of formiterol ones, you are still in the safer um, range. Um, again, the same thing, which is the inflammatory markers. Uh, I have to go backward. The inflammatory markers with the moderate dose of inhaled corticosteroid, be it the number of xenophils in the sputum or in the endobronchial biopsies, they are improving with a regular dosing, uh, which is, has been shown in different studies. And in, in the meta-analysis of a network, if you are using fluticasone, um, um, uh, propionate, and salmitrol, they are comparable to the other uh, budesonide with another lava uh, in their effectiveness and in improving the uh, quality of life. So when you optimize the, the patients on, uh, on inhaled corticosteroid on a moderate dose, you would see that after one year, only there is 70% of a good control of the asthma. Whereas if you are using the MART and you are, the patient is not well adherent to it, there is still 44% of them not controlling their asthma. The other thing is that the exacerbation rate is, is, is the same between the MART and the uh, regular uh, dosing of uh, inhaled corticosteroid. And it is the same thing on the inflammatory markers. Now the most important thing, I think we have to concentrate, so you give me another two minutes in compensation of our delay. All right, this is the use By of the- By the way, you have two minutes also. Exactly, excellent. Short acting beta, beta agonist. This is the most catastrophic thing. We want to cut on this because we do know that patients who are on regular dose, uh, who are overusing a short acting beta agonist, they are at risk of adverse effect. But if they are using it within the context of a prescribed limit, you are safer with your patient. Because you do know that regular use of beta agonists will lead to tachyphylaxis. If they, today they are using 200, tomorrow they will use 400 mic, the day after they need 800 to get the same effect. We need to cut into this. So, um, Regular use of inhaled corticosteroid will cut on the SAPA. This is first most important thing. If you get your patient adherent to uh, inhaled corticosteroid, it will uh, stop the overuse of SAPA. 
Second, uh, there was an analysis done by Sibrasat. Uh, he looked into uh, 42 studies looking to the use of SAPA among patients with asthma, and it had shown that if it is used within the context of a proper treatment, there is no increase in the serious adverse event, discontinuation of a treatment due to adverse event, all cause mortality or disease related mortality. So we can still use SAPA safely within the context of prescription. I will skip those. Uh, just uh, here, just comparing for you the uh, for meterol, uh, uh, short acting uh, uh, speed with the salbutamol. Salbutamol is, is okay. So we need a better understanding with our patient. And then the, the, then the next few years, you will have the guidelines of a personalized, tailored therapy for each patient, rather than just a generalized guidelines. Thank you.